Good morning, good afternoon. This is Everett O'Keefe from Ignite Press, and I am excited about today's book launch livecast. I have with me the one, the only, uh, Julie Bruns, and she is here today to talk about her very new book, Launching Today, Peace, and Pos uh, Peace Possibilities and Perspective. Uh, eight Secrets to Serenity and Satisfaction in Your Life and Career. Um, not only is it a beautiful book, but Julie is a beautiful human being, and I'm excited to bring her on to talk about her book. Well, Julie, come on, come aboard. How are you today? Good. Good. Try not to cry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is it a little bit overwhelming? You've got emails going out. You've got... Yeah. People coming back, I bet you've been hearing from people that are buying your book today. Yes, yes. I have been. It's, it's um, inspiring yeah. and encouraging and exciting and all of the above and emotional and yeah, yeah. awesome. Uh, really, really, really incredible. I'm excited um, about your book. I was I was reading some of it uh, this morning and you know, it was funny. You have some really surprising stories in here. Um, but before we get to those, I would like for you to tell us a little bit about who you are. Tell us a little bit about your background, Julie, and how you come to this point. Uh, I think the first thing I would say about myself is that I am a lifelong learner. I love uh, learning things and meeting people and discovering new concepts and ideas. I've always been thirsty and curious for knowledge my entire life. Um, and I wrote this book so that people in my, well, you're probably, we're probably gonna talk about that for a minute. So let me just back up a little bit and say, I love education. I love inspiring people and I love learning new things. And um, it's brought me to this place where, you know, I'm a lifelong learner. I'm still learning every single day. And um, having a book out in the world is like, a, it's, a, it's a dream come true. And it's something I never actually, it, it's, it's funny. On one hand, I've dreamt about it my whole life. And on the other hand, I, I never really thought about actually having it in the world like it is today. So um, I'm just someone that loves connecting with people and loves inspiring people. So I'm hoping that book will do that. That's my main point. Well, I love it. And I, I did put the uh, an Amazon link on the ticker uh, down below. And in fact, I will put it uh, also in the comments. Let me do that now. And so that'll be available for everybody. Now, on the on the subject of comments, if you're watching, please feel free to comment, ask Julie questions, cheer her on, whatever. I will share those comments with Julie as we go. And so I appreciate that. In fact, we've already got uh, Chris. Uh, Chris says, I got my copy. Who wouldn't want a copy of this about, about peace, possibilities, and perspective? That's right. Who wouldn't want a copy? Um, Sarah said, um, we need more peace and to be in a place to see the possibilities. What an inspiration you are. That is wonderful. Yeah. Um, I think one of the things I was enjoying about the beginning of this, Julie, was you're talking about um, a, like people recognize that, yes, they can do things, but they don't necessarily get beyond the intellectual. Yeah, that's a possibility too. That's really a possibility. Like, like, like that could really happen. Not only is it possible. In fact, you had a great quote on it. I hope I can find it. Uh, maybe you remember it. But it was like, not only is it possible, but like, it's. Uh, shoot, I'm trying to find it now, and of course, I'm not going to. Yeah. I didn't highlight it. Shoot. Sorry about that. But I just appreciated that. Um, so, you told a story in the book that cracked me up. Um, and I didn't realize this when you decided to try out for uh, the uh, cheer team for was it for the Chicago Bulls? Yeah. <laughs> okay. How did that happen? Like, how did you just like? So, this has been my whole life. I'm thinking back to like the first time I did something like this, and I didn't tell anybody. Or I just was always like, in my head, I maybe I could try that or maybe I could do that or maybe I could have that, but I wouldn't go to everyone in my life and say, what do you think? Cause I just had this sneaking suspicion that I would try to get talked out of it. So that's what happened with this particular story. I just was driving in the car. This was radio. There was no internet. There was none of that. No YouTube. Maybe there was, but not, you know, it's 19, late 1980s, early nineties. And I was driving in the car on my way home from work and it said, there's a radio commercial 
hey, come try out for the Chicago Lovables and be a dancer and see the games and on the front line, you know, like on the 50 yard line, all of that stuff, not 50 yard line, but um, it was a really cool idea. And I thought, I'm just gonna go do it. I'm not gonna tell anyone. I specifically told myself, I'm not gonna tell anyone because if I fail at it, it's not that big of a deal. If I make it, I have a great story. I'm just gonna go try it. But I just was like, I'm gonna get up and do it. Who knows what can happen? I didn't know about the statistics. I didn't know how many people they were going to pick. I didn't know how many people are going to show up. And I just went there and every hour on the hour during the day, as they were making cuts, I just kept making it and passed it further and further and further. And I was like, I can't believe this. And I don't, I don't think I had a phone at the time. I don't, I'm pretty sure I didn't. So I couldn't text people and say, you're never going to believe where I am or what I'm doing. I just thought, I'm just going to stay here. I'm going to take it all in. I'm going to do my best. And if I make it great, and if I don't, I'll tell everyone what I did later. But I just knew that if I told people what I was doing, most people would say, not because they didn't want me to succeed, they'd just be like, set expectations. It's probably not going to happen for you. And I didn't want to hear that. Um, I think there's a great lesson there because the fact that you did it the way you did it, um, like you said, if you failed, nobody would know about it. Um, whereas if you told everybody, hey, I'm going to go do this, yes, not only would some of them prepare you for failure, mm -hmm. which is not really what you needed, um, but yeah, the, the stakes are a whole lot higher. Um, yeah, so I, I see that. Tell us a bit about who'd you write this book for and, and, and why? So I wrote it for really two people for myself. Um, what I would have wanted when I was 25, when I was 22, 16 even. Um, I wanted someone to be, I wanted a fairy godmother. I wanted someone to be telling me, here's what you can achieve, Julie, and here's what you can dream, and here's what you can do. And and um, um, not about working hard necessarily, but like, here's how you need to look at the world so you can have what you want and what you dream of. I didn't have um, someone like that in my life. I had great teachers along the way, and um, I had great friends, and I had some, you know, inspiring siblings, but I just, you know, everyone was trying to figure out their own path. And, and I felt like I was on my own. So I wrote it for that person. I wrote it for the 50 or 60 year old person who's like thinking, I don't like my job and what am I gonna do with the rest of my life? And life is short and I want to have more. I wrote it for that person. And then finally I wrote it for HR people. I've been in corporate, I was in corporate America for over 20 years and I worked for some great people. And I always saw stressed out HR leaders, team leaders, um, leadership, I mean people in leadership in general, just like, I don't, we don't have enough time to give people what they need at work. We have to work and we have to get, you know, the bottom line is making money. People need nurturing, people need developing, and there is never enough time to do it. So this book can help that person who's leading a team um, to nurture their own employees. This book can be given by that leader to their employees to say, hey, I can't give you everything you need, but read this book. It won't take you very long. There's great lessons in here. Start implementing them today and you're going to be happier And in, in, in uh, the consequence of that obviously is you have happier, more creative, more productive employees and you yourself as a leader are all of those things too. So um, yeah, that's what I wrote it for. Fantastic. Um, I would be remiss to not say uh, the book is available right now on Amazon. And in fact, uh, right now there is a special, you can actually pick up the Kindle version for 99 cents. Uh, the paperback is also available there, but the Kindle version is 99 cents. We encourage you to pick that up. Uh, and it won't be that way for long. In fact, I think tomorrow it goes back up to uh, to the retail price. So um, so when you were writing the book, did you, is, there, is there some favorite part of the book that you would like to share with people? Some uh, little nugget from it or favorite story that you think would be appropriate? Oh, there's so many good stories. That's always a hard one, honestly. It's a hard yeah, one. That is a hard one. I would say one of my favorite ones is is going to the Lion King in London um, in the early 90s when I um, when it was sold out. Um, I was traveling for work. I was with a bunch of, um, I was with two other women co-workers training clients in London on the software. And um, I got to my hotel and I saw that all these tickets were, it was sold out, the Lion King. And I was like, all right, well, I'm not meant to go there. Um, it was really just that that quickly. Uh, it was a fleeting moment, and and thought came into my mind. I'm like, I'm not meant to go. No big deal. I'll do, I'll do something else. But when I got to the office the next day, the, mostly guys they were training. They said to me, "What what are your plans for the week?" And I said, "Well, I was wanted to see the Lion King, but it's sold out." And they're like, "You should go anyways, because you never know." 
And I thought to myself, all right, well, we have that in Chicago too. When you go there and people are waiting on the sidelines trying to sell you tickets, double or triple the price or whatever. I'm like, I'm not willing to do that. Like, no, people will come out of the theater and they will um, give you the ticket at face value for people that don't show up. You know, okay, great. I thought, you know, what do I have to lose? I was on my own. The other two ladies were doing something else without me. Um, I might as well just go and check it out. And, and they're not leading me down. You know, they're not going to do anything risky, tell me to do anything risky. I'm going to go and see what happens. Uh, I didn't look it up. I didn't. I think this is just at the beginning of the Internet. I don't even know if it existed yet. And um, I got in the cab, a taxi. I went. I got out of, in front of the theater and I thought, oh, there are so many people here. I'm not going to get in. But in my head, I'm not going to get in. But I'm, I'm here anyways. I might as well try it. You just never know is what I said to myself. And there were about 50 people in front of me. I was by myself, obviously. And they were just like the guy said at the office. The guy, employees just kept coming out saying, we, we have a ticket. We have a ticket. And finally, um, he came out and said, Are, do we have any single people in line? And of those, all of those people in that line, there was no one else by themselves, which meant no one's going to take that ticket because they're not going to leave their friend or their three other friends to go in by themselves. So he comes all the way down to me and I'm like, I'm just waiting. Like someone's going to claim this ticket. And no one did. He came up to me, 50 people down and said, do you want this ticket? It was 20 quid. And I was expecting it to be like a hundred dollars. And I said, no, come, come with me. And he takes me in the path and I, I'm thinking, well, I'm probably going to have a crappy view. It's going to be obstructed. Not a big deal, whatever. At least I'm going to be seeing the Lion King in London. And when he takes me to my seat and we're walking along this dark kind of back alley of the theater and I go into this like Queens balcony <laughs> and I looked at him, I, I think you have me mistaken. This is not, this can't be my seat for $20. This cannot be. And he's like, no, this is your seat. Like I work here. I know where your, your seat is. <laughs> and I just sat down. Like, I cannot believe I'm in this balcony in this like Queens seat it was a beautiful seat it was open it was all this room it was a beautiful view i'm like i cannot believe it i'm wait i kept waiting for him to come back to tell me he made a mistake and in walks a, a guy and says well at least someone's using my tickets i'm glad someone's gonna be see the show and i said what do you mean like why are these tickets even here why are these seats open he said my friends decided they didn't want to come and this one other person couldn't come and so here i am so me and this random stranger are sitting in this four person sweet balcony watching the lion king <laughs> for twenty dollars incredible no and i didn't tell anyone i was doing it same thing i didn't i just said i'm just gonna try it and see what happens i i, I love that attitude there was a lesson in your book that i thought was interesting i really hadn't considered it was you were talking about um how sometimes like all these tools that are available to us now kind of are a disservice to us at times because mm -hmm. We can Google it, we can research it, we can read this story, we can see someone else who's done it, we can do all of this. And that that perhaps gets in the way of our spontaneity. Is that, did I get it right? 100%, 100%. I remember back in um, college, I was taking some classes and same thing happened. I was taking a, it was it was in the mid nineties, right after the internet was a big started or whatever. And I, I made this comment to my professor, like, I think it's gonna end up being a kind of a bad thing because people aren't gonna be connecting as much and all these other things. And he said, in the five years that he was a professor at that school, no one had ever brought that concept up to him before. Like, how could it be negative? Um, and it, it, it is. I mean, obviously, it's, we have information at our fingertips. That's phenomenal. We can look up someone's name and all kinds of things. And I'm not, I'm not saying none of that is good. Um, but when we research and analyze and look at all the numbers and ask a million people and see what it's, it's like, that takes away from the spontaneity. Not only that, but it takes away from your hope. And your and your you know like your possibilities. You're like maybe I can, and don't tell a million people. Just go do it. And if you can do it, if you're thinking you can do it, you probably can do it. Don't listen to other people that say you can't. Listen to the people that say sure, go for it. But most of the people aren't going to say sure, go for it. Not because they don't love you or want you to succeed. It's because they don't want you to fail and feel bad. But that's not how we ever get anything accomplished. Well, and and isn't it just like like. I'm the worst at this. It's so easy to play devil's advocate, right? I'm not really sure why we do it. It's, but it's, I don't know if it's human nature or if it's some of us, some of our natures, but uh, someone will say, Hey, I'm thinking about doing this. And first thought is, Oh, you know, you might stumble, you know, uh, be prepared for stumbling yeah. or whatever. I don't know why we do that. I think it's, 
number i think i think it's mindset i think we're just, it's just easier to not so i think it's that fear in us that says like what if i fail then i'm gonna then it's my ego and then it's my it's my reputation whatever it is and so you get afraid and it's more comfortable to be afraid and not take risks than it is to take the risk i mean that's just human nature we want to stay safe our brain our ego wants us to stay safe um we we want to do that to be secure and have what we need and going and taking a risk is unsafe it's it's insecurity it's 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 not, it, it might end in something great, but it might end in something bad. And what you have over here isn't as bad. So, so, so don't risk it. So it's just, it's common, it's human nature, but it never gets you what you want. Sitting back and being comfortable never gets you what, what you want. I want to share some uh, comments that uh, people have been uh, posting here. And I thought I'd let you have, uh, uh, see these because I don't think you've been able to see them. Yeah. So styled by Layla, love your says love your courage. You have always led by example. Uh, Tracy here says so happy for you, so proud of you, and you're an inspiration. Holly Holly points out that she's always loved your positive po uh, positivity. It resonates in all aspects of your life. Chris is saying how fun the Lion King story, loving that. Um, Julie says. You, Jules, are offering all of us your amazing wisdom. I love your first of many books, Peace, Possibilities, and Perspective. You are uplifting our world. Wow. Um, hard to beat that. Hard to beat that. I, I do have a, another question from your, from your book. You have a chapter devoted to um, mindfulness and focus, and you write, and not multitasking. Yeah. Um, but I thought multitasking, you know, I mean, uh, aren't we supposed to all be multitasking, getting so many more things done and yeah. all of that? Tell us about mindfulness and focus. Yeah, so there's a couple of cool statistics in there and you can read a ton about multitasking and how it's not good for your brain and there's all kinds of research about it. Um, but when people think about being mindful and focusing on one thing, it gives them anxiety. I'm, I'm the same way sometimes. Like, what do you mean? I just have to focus on this thing and I have all these other things to do, but you're never, ever doing more than one thing with more than 40% of your brain and effort. So we think we're doing a good job. And I think women especially are really good at this. I know they are because all the women in my life are doing this. Um, and we think, all right, we're going to do this and this and this and this. And then I'm going to knock five things off my to-do list. And look at me, I'm a multitasking like genius. This is awesome. But none of those things have your full attention, number one. None of those things are actually like sinking into your mind and your heart and your being, and, and, and you're not you're not experiencing any of them really. You're just um, you're you're forty percent in each one of those things. And if you think about doing anything at forty percent of our capacity, kids the same way, you would never tell anyone. Yeah, just do that forty percent effort. But that's what we're doing every time we multitask. There's another statistic. It's not actually in my book, but um, it's an important one. And it's and when we are actually emailing someone and we're listening to a webinar or a podcast and we're trying to work. Um, there's a study done at the University of London, actually, and what happens to your brain, it's like emailing and listening to that webinar and trying to send that email when you're when you're multitasking is the same as smoking marijuana. And it it does the same thing to your brain. And really what that means is wow. it, just, it, it actually takes your brain from the regular brain that it is at a grown adult to an eight year old's brain. So I talk about this in my workshops, like, would you ever tell, and I know it's crazy. Would you ever tell an eight-year-old kid to send your work email for you to your boss or to your client? <laughs> no, you wouldn't. You wouldn't. That's what we're doing. And I think we can all probably um, prove this by going back and seeing some of the emails we've sent. And hopefully you didn't hit send when you were listening to that webinar because you, you're going to make a mistake. It's not going to catch a, um, a typo. You're going to put two words together, whatever it is. And someone's going to look at it and think like, this isn't this doesn't look very professional. And there's a reason it's because you're not doing it with your whole brain. So I, I thought wow. it was just really important to talk about being in the present moment and and the science behind it. So I give tips on how to do it. And then the science behind what happens to your brain when you are present in every moment, what it's actually doing to your physical body and your brain. And it's it's unbelievable how, how good it is for you. Wow. Um, yeah. Okay, so that's pretty sobering. Now, I'm going to tell you, I am not one of those people who will listen to a webinar or, or watch a video while trying to do stuff, mainly because I absolutely fail at it. Um, I just find myself go, I just, I just can't. Like yeah. I, I can barely listen to music while I'm doing, uh, yeah. doing those things. Yeah. Um, but 
you know, I am sadly easily distractible and I do find myself bouncing from, you think about in our day, we have so many micro tasks. It's send this email, look at this thing, check that, do this, whatever. And many of them are just little tasks that take a minute, two minutes like that. Yep. I find myself even getting distracted in the midst of one of those, mm -hmm. you know, instead of, well, let me just finish this one before I check that email or before I see, you know, who's texting on the phone or yep. um, something like that. Horrible about that. Yeah. Uh, it's human nature because everyone does it. There's yeah. tricks, there's tricks and it takes a lot of um, focus and effort, but you can just not turn your phone on. I know it's like, Oh my gosh. But if you sat down to work on something for 20 minutes, told yourself you're not doing anything else. You're not going to open up another email. You're not even going to have your email open. That's what I did when I wrote my book every day for two hours a day. I didn't have my phone open. I just had Microsoft Word open, no email or anything. So I don't see the notifications. I don't see my phone beeping or and any of that. And it's amazing what you really can get done when you focus that way. What happens is it takes you less time. You think it's going to take you more time because um, you're not doing three other things, but it actually takes you less time. You, your, your brain opens up. You can be more creative and more productive. It's actually, and, it, and it's better for your brain. So, um, and there's a lot of science around that too. So, um, it's tough, but people do it. Actually, some of the most successful people we know do that. They only turn their emails on. Um, there's famous people. I think you, uh, I want to say Oprah, Jerry Seinfeld. There's people that only check email at certain times of the day, like they turn it on at eight or at noon and then at four o'clock. And sometimes they'll actually put out of office messages that say, I'm I only check my email twice a day. Look for a response from me after these times. And no one's, no one's holding a gun to your head saying, you better check that email every five minutes. When you see that envelope, you better click on it. That's you. You do that to yourself. No one's telling you to do that. So um, as long as you can get your work done and get what you need to get done, you're going to be a better performer this way. There's, there's all kinds of science around it. Well, and I've, I've often thought about, you know, restricting my email to, you know, in that way of only checking a couple times a day. And then as a, publisher keeping so many balls up in the air and you know wanted to be very responsive to clients and all of those things i'm always i've, I've never pulled the trigger on mm -hmm. attempting to do that it's hard uh, to do yeah a couple but just because it's hard to do it doesn't mean it can't be done yeah and, and that's true and like you said you, you know sometimes you set the own expectation that that client that you need to respond to that email as quickly as possible mm -hmm. when the client shoots it off and they're you know, probably not expecting a, a response right away. And by the way, you can train them not to. Exactly. Right? Expectations. And train, train, train them not to. Yeah. Um, some other comments here. Uh, Layla, uh, stop by Layla. You've shown that there are no coincidences. There are so many possibilities if you're willing to trust in the process. Um, Chris had to throw in, by the way, love your scarf. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I love that. Um, so uh, again, let me uh, remind people the book is for sale right now. You can pick it up uh, on Amazon. The Kindle version is 99 cents today only. Tomorrow it goes back up to retail uh, and the paperback uh, is available as well for $14.95 and you can pick those up on Amazon right now. I would recommend you do that and I also would recommend if there are others in your life that you believe would benefit from, frankly, having more peace and possibilities and perspective and just sharing from some of Julie's perspective, then pick up a copy for them as well. I think that they'll absolutely um, value it. And I know that it isn't a, a traditional uh, Valentine's Day gift, but mm -hmm. I don't know why it couldn't be. Um, uh, so be be thinking about, about that. So um, Julie, the, uh, you mentioned the process of writing the book and shutting everything out and all of that. How hard was it for you to write your book? Just to, this is, this is the publisher asking now, yeah, yeah. you know, how, how, how hard was that process for you? Everyone's experience is a little different. So I thought, I thought it was going to be harder. Getting the words out is the easy part. Going back and editing and rereading and trying to catch things is the harder part. Um, if you have something to say, it flows pretty easily. I think that's probably going to be, I'm not, I'm a nonfiction writer. I'm not a fiction writer, so I can't speak to that. But from the nonfiction standpoint, it's, um, I had something to say and I knew what I wanted to talk about and I knew what the message I wanted to, to have. Um, and I sat down to write every day. And if the, 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 the part that made it easiest for me is number one, I did what I, every 
reading workshop tells you, writing workshop tells you to do is, is focus and don't do it all day long every day. I did it for two hours a day. I said, like I told you, I turned off all notifications. But if I sat down to write about something that um, I thought I wanted, like, so I needed another story for the gratitude chapter or another story for the resilience chapter, I would say, I'm gonna write about gratitude today, but I would sit down and within five or 10 minutes, if I didn't have something flowing out of my brain into my onto the paper, I switched and I said, you know what? No, I really don't have a story about that today. I have another manifestation story or something. So I would switch and just open up that chapter and write about that. And that was always a lot easier than just racking my brain and feeling stressed out. And then you get in that, um, that spirit of contraction and now nothing's flowing. So I knew that that wasn't the right way to go about it. So it ended up being easier than I thought. I really loved, I really loved doing it. I wasn't expecting to love it as much as I did, which is why I want to write more books now. Um, fantastic. I, you, I think you're also pointing out a couple, um, a couple things that we would, we recommend. So you're chunking, right? You're, 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 you're like, okay, I'm going to work on this chunk. And if that chunk's not coming, well, let's just switch off to another one, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think especially with stories, <clears throat> they come or they don't come. And okay. and you start to write, I, I don't know if you feel like, like you start going, it's like suddenly like, oh, I have more to say about this. Oh, mm -hmm. I thought I forgot about that. Mm -hmm. um, did you find the writing process to be a clarifying process in regards to your content and your message? 100, 100%. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Seeing yeah, the words coming uh, down, yeah, rereading them and then and then going like, all right, I'd rather say it this way or no, I love the way I said it. That's from my heart. I'm going to leave it like that. Yeah. Um, I'm going to bring this up because I, I just appreciate it. Thank you so much, Brian. Wrote, Thanks for getting Julie to this place. Average speaks very highly. Um, you know, Brian, really, it's our it's our uh, it really is our honor. It's one of the great things I love about what we do is we get to help bring other people's messages to the world. Um, I, I honestly don't want to be that, that the person standing on the mountaintop sharing a me sharing the message. I love helping other people share the message that they have to bring, what they've been inspired and sometimes ordained uh, to bring. And so I appreciate that very much. Yeah, you do. Uh, so, Julie, um, you mentioned gratitude. You mentioned resilience. Um, do you want to speak to one of those now, kind of before we close this off? Um, yeah, I think they're both, I love to talk about both of them. I think I'll talk about resilience because I think in this um, day and age in our climate right now in general, it's, it's a tough one. Um, everyone needs more of it. And then sometimes people are like, how do you get resilience and what do you do to build resilience? And um, it's just, it's something that you get by trying, taking risks, uh, failing, almost always you're going to fail a little bit you're going to succeed you're going to learn something you build resilience and you build grit because you're living your life and you're taking those risks and you're trying to make things happen and you're not going to be 100 percent successful and no one's expecting you to be but sometimes you you put the pressure on yourself to be that way um it's something that you can model i know it's like for parents you know building it in kids is, it's like you, you can't give it to them you can't give them resilience you can show them how you are resilient you can show them how you back, um, bounce back from things. You can show them um, what skills are good to bounce back from things. You can model that. And then you can say, hey, here's another way to think about it. So you're teaching them different perspectives um, to yourself as well. And you're showing them what's possible out there. And every little thing they do that makes them stronger is building that resilience. And um, I tell about the, the joke in, this, in the book is um, my sister Sue, she's uh, five years older than me. She picked me up from high school sometimes. And I'd say, you know, oh, that boy that I like doesn't like me or that teacher was, you know, didn't give me the A I, I wanted or whatever. And she would say, oh, it, that builds that builds character. That builds character. She would say it, it builds character. And we would joke that we would say, like, how, how much character do you need to build before you have enough? Can you just like <laughs> add a ton of it? So I talk about this in the book, like, it builds character. All that crap builds character. And wouldn't it be nice just to be done? Like, okay, I'm good. I, I graduated high school. I have a ton of lessons in character. I'm, I'm done now. But that's not how life goes, right? <laughs> yeah. Can, I not, can, we, can I please stop building character now? Yes. Yeah. So that was our joke. Like, uh, And Ian, if you're always building it, there's there's got to be a point where you would have enough, right? But that's not how life works. Yeah, that's a good point. And and ultimately a good thing because I think we always have more to learn to prepare us for that next step oh, or the next challenge or the next person, right? Mm -hmm. you, know, you, think of the, you know, why do we learn some of these lessons? And I think it's to share some of these lessons with other people. Um, 
Yeah. Well, it was terrific. Uh, Holly, while you were talking, I shared this, but I'll, pa I'll push it up here again. Holly said the idea of resilience being the ability to turn pain into strength, wisdom, and joy, this really resonated with me. Thank you. I thought I would pass that on to you. Thank you. Well, fantastic. Uh, Julie, thank you so much for uh, for taking the time to write the book. Um, that is a passion. And I'm glad that you found the experience to be easier than you thought it would be, um, uh, that you found it to be a clarifying experience. We do see that. If you want to get good at a topic, write about it. You suddenly, uh, um, you find you know a lot more than you knew and you're able to, able to organize it in a way that really helps shape uh, shape the message. Yeah. So, uh, grateful for you taking the time to do that. Uh, for anybody else watching, please go pick up your copy, buy a copy for somebody else. Peace, possibilities, and perspective on Amazon today. So, Julie, thank you uh, very much. I'm going to sign us out. And uh, any any closing words or anything that you'd like to share with uh, people watching or people considering buying the book? Um, if you um can't read all of the book, read a couple chapters that are gonna, that resonate with you. You're going to learn something. You're going to be inspired to do something different, I promise. And um, I wrote this book to help people. And um, I can't wait to hear um, when you do share it and people learn lessons, please reach out to me and let me know because that's the, the biggest gift I can get is some, it, it mattered to someone and it changed someone's mindset or, um, or perspective. So, and, and I'll add, you've written it in a very easy conversational style. Um, it doesn't, it's, this isn't, doesn't flow like a textbook or anything like that. It is, it's a, it's comfortable and enjoyable and you've done a great job with that. Thank you. All right. Well, uh, thank you so much everybody for joining us. Uh, again, pick up peace, uh, possibilities and perspective on Amazon. Take care and God bless.